Welcome to DOS Geek. Yes, I'm going to talk about this Apple event. Yes, I primarily deal with Linux and hardware and all of that stuff, but I've been called an Apple fanboy before, so you could go ahead and leave it in the comments below. I'll laugh the whole way to the bank. Just because I like something, just because I think something is good, does not mean I'm a fanboy, but apparently that's what we do in the tech world, so I'll take it. Give it to me. Give me your worst Apple insult out there. Well, this event was interesting because unlike events prior with jobs, everything was top secret. And in this case, everything that happened at this event was pretty much leaked before the event. There was no surprise for me at all at this event, which in a way is kind of disappointing that they can't keep things a secret at all. There are some interesting business changes going on with Apple and some evolution in the company itself as it kind of switches itself to focus more heavily on the software and services side than in prior iterations where their hardware really was everything. And we weren't just getting iterative upgrades, we were getting advancement in cell phone tech, but that's kind of gone to the wayside for now anyways. And we'll talk about that more as you look into the, some of these services here that they're offering. In fact, that's how they kicked off the conference. The first thing that they kicked off with was the Apple Arcade. So my guess is this is their best ability here, which is in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, best uh, idea to compete with Google Stadia. Unfortunately, as unexcited as I am about Google Stadia, this is even less exciting. It does come with a pretty good price point at $4.99 a month, and you get 100 games or so that you can play uh, between your iPad or your iPhone or any of your Apple devices. None of the games here were particularly exciting, though, unlike the Stadia, which had launches for major titles like Assassin's Creed and IPs that people are very familiar with. They started this one with Konami showing off a Frogger game, arcade game on there, and then Capcom with some diving game, you know, and they looked like pretty much mobile games. They were okay. There was nothing exciting or innovative there that just made me want to uh, go out immediately and subscribe $4.99 a month to play it. But I assume they're not going after your gamers who have been gamers their whole life, some I'm not, I don't consider myself a hardcore gamer because I can't play well in any of the games I play, but I do like to play a lot of games and have always since I was a kid and nothing here would appease me. Now, maybe uh, my mom personally who didn't play games other than, um, you know, some card games on the computer may find some of these mobile games fun or certain people who, you know, just want to play a, a quick game, maybe in a parking lot or while they're traveling would find this service interesting. But I think for the most part, it was pretty unimpressive, at least from what I seen uh, that they were demoing there. So compared to Google Stadia, I think they had to release something in this market and <laughs> this wouldn't be it. You know, part of Apple's problem being in a closed garden that they are is a lot of these services don't work anywhere else. With Google Stadia, you have the ability to, and, and I'm not a fan of Google Stadia at all, but as far as an offering goes, you have the ability to stream it from your TV, you have the ability to stream it from your phones, and any computer, whether you have a Mac, and any computer has Google Chrome on it, whether you have a Mac, you have Linux, you have Windows, it doesn't matter, you could play those games through a Chrome browser on there. Now this is much different in Apple. I think they just released the ability to play Apple Music from any browser. But for the most part, if you're not on an Apple device, you can't use these Apple services like their subscription service for magazines and things. You have to have an Apple device to access it. They really are still focused on that closed garden idea. And I just don't think that is competitive in this day and age. There's so many people who just don't like Apple, uh, right or wrong. That's their stance on it. They're not a fan of Apple's products. And so you really don't have anybody outside of their infrastructure, which as I understand, there's some loss there with iPhones dropping, I think 12% uh, on, I, I believe it was sales. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but they're, they're losing some leverage. They're losing some excitement around their phones to say the least. And uh, you know, the idea of moving to a service model in a closed garden for them may be a mistake. You also have TV Plus, which was announced as well. They showed off a couple shows there. The Morning Show, which I didn't see as exciting at all, but, you know, it's just a preview. 
of it and for all mankind and a a new show drama called C, which is based on the idea of humans losing their sight. So this has Jason Momo Momoa. Jason Momoa. I should know how to pronounce that. My wife's obsessed with the man. Uh, Jason Momoa on the series, uh, I think just having him alone is going to bring lots of female viewership uh, to watch the show. But overall, it honestly looked pretty cool. Kind of a dystopian future where humans have lost their eyesight. Suddenly they have for generations and suddenly some babies are born that have eyesight and the tribes are kind of fighting to steal these babies that have eyesight. So it was kind of an interesting look at a show there. Um, you know, they're obviously going up against some very big services. You have Disney announcing their TV service out there. You have Netflix, of course, who dominates in this arena. You've got just everybody vying for this Hulu, the space and trying to make their own services and get your monthly costs. The problem with all these services per month is who can afford them all. By the time you're done, you'd have hundreds and hundreds of dollars per month to watch all of these things. So it is getting a little bit ridiculous. Uh, I will say they came in with a really good price point at $4.99 per month. So you got $4.99 per month for their arcade games. If you want to play 100 plus games that they're going to have in that, you have $4.99 a month for TV+. Plus. I don't remember what their magazine subscription is, but let's say it's uh, 6 to $12 a month, whatever it is. So you've got that on top. I mean, it's just nickel and diming you to death per month for all of this stuff. I assume the next big release will be, hey, we're going to bundle all this together for one low price um, at some point. One of the cool things they did do here, though, is if you buy any of the new Apple devices starting, I think, September 20th when they all come out, uh, you get one year included of the uh, Apple TV Plus. So that'll be a good way for them to get people addicted to their particular shows and things like that. Next up was their iPad. So they had a focus on the iPad OS to really differentiate it from iOS, which I think is interesting. They're really trying to push this, which they did in some of their commercials, idea of moving away from the desktop and having this iPad kind of be your desktop replacement. You can see in even their advertising here with the pictures, they're focusing on that kind of laptop look with the keyboard cover on it. Um, basically, you get a new larger 10.2-inch um, Retina display. This is the new 7th Gen iPad. 3.5 million pixels compared to the laptop they said was the, whatever the best-selling laptop was. I don't think they specifically mentioned it. I couldn't see what brand it was, um, but they're saying it has three times more pixels, 3.7 times wider viewing angle. It's got their new A10 Fusion chip inside, and of course they picked uh, that random PC. Picked on that random PC to say that their A10 Fusion chip is two times faster than the CPU that comes in whatever the best-selling laptop is. Um, new smart keyboard takes advantage of the Apple Pencil. They have new multitasking, fanning, sliding capabilities, desktop browsing capability in Safari, which if you've ever used an iPad, that's a welcome advancement because there's nothing worse than just having a big mobile phone and just having a mobile phone browser view versus having the full desktop browser view of a web page. You can miss out on a lot of features in that. So I think that's cool that they're doing that. Um, you can connect some of your devices into it. Uh, they didn't really say whether they were moving to USB-C, but I'd heard that rumor. If you know, let me know in the comments below. But it, I, all I can assume is it's the lightning port USB devices you can plug in to transfer photos and things off of. Not sure on their new photos app um, where they have more features for editing and things right from the iPad. Swipe up to capture screenshots, turn entire web pages into PDF, and then annotate on top of them. Uh, I think the big surprise here that you're going to see throughout this whole event was the cost structure. For the first time, I kind of see Apple actually going after the mid-level price points for the their equipment, which generally they're the ones who kind of break the whole shock factor for costs for their devices, right? Because you want to go to the Starbucks and let your friends know that you dropped a grand on a stupid phone. That's what you go to Apple to do. In this case, they're really focusing on the lower cost. So this iPad only costs $329 um, for the new editor of upgrade. And they have an EDU version, so an education version at $299. Now, I thought this was really interesting because Chromebooks have absolutely dominated in the academic space, likely because it's so much cheaper for the school system to purchase them in bulk because of their low upfront cost. 
So you can see by advertising this $299 for education, they're really trying to get this into the school front, which is very important. If you want mass adoption of your architecture for the next generations growing up, you've got to get into those schools because they're going to come out of school into the business world and be expecting to be working on the same things that they used in school. This was a huge strategy for Microsoft back in the day. Google has dominated in this territory recently with the Chromebook. And now you see Apple going back in there, I think, uh, for with that low price point offering $299, envisioning a future where people were using iPads instead of desktops and laptops. Every time I've tried to use an iPad uh, or any tablet, Android tablet, iPad tablet, doesn't matter. It just is not the same as using a desktop or a laptop. There's just so much to be desired. Now, I think the best tablet out there probably is your Microsoft Surface. Uh, that is the closest one that I could ever use to actually mimic a desktop experience and do real work on it. Uh, so I don't think that the specs on this iPad would compete with the latest Microsoft Surface tablets out there either. Um, obviously, they've got a lot of competition in this front. This to me was kind of blah. They also announced their new Apple Watch. So they ran some really cool videos. They were inspirational. They really, uh, you know, pulling on the heartstrings here of people whose lives were saved because of the watches, specifically because of the monitoring heart rates and auto calling 911 uh, if they were having an emergency. And these were real people giving their stories of how Apple watches saved their lives. And it was kind of an interesting view in these Series 5 watches that I had not uh, taken into consideration. I'd read some stories and things about people, but there was, for instance, an individual with hearing disability uh, who used his watch to monitor or to notify him uh, with the baby's sleeping patterns when the baby had woken up. Just different uses for watches that I hadn't thought of. Uh, and obviously, they're kind of focusing on the medical benefits that the watch could provide here and the health research that went behind it. Uh, obviously, they worked with a lot of universities and institutes and medical research centers to come up with the technology to be able to monitor heart rates. And now they're adding things in there, such as hearing studies to help let people know when sound is too high and could damage their ears with women's health issues and uh, additional advancements in heart and movement. So if you've ever had an Apple Watch, I have I personally just it was just another thing to charge. Um, but I could see individuals who uh, work out heavily or constantly and, you know, are on the go, how the watch could be beneficial for them. I think Apple does one of, is one of the best when it comes to their, the watch world, although I've still kind of like the iPads and tablets, if not really found a use for them that made me go, oh my gosh, I have to have one. It was just another thing constantly dinging and binging at me, but a lot of people like them. For instance, my wife wears hers all the time, absolutely loves it. So uh, it really is up to your personal preference there. There was nothing extremely innovative about these new watches. You get a new display that is always on, which was pretty cool. Um, so the watch face now is always visible. And apparently that's because of this new low temperature polysilicone oxide display is what they called it. it. allows it to go from one hertz to 60 hertz. So it's not tearing down that battery by staying on all the time. If you've had an Apple Watch before, you kind of had to always turn at it and to look at it to get the face to come on so you could see the time. And now you won't have to do that. They've got new ambient sensors, all day, 18 hour battery life still, built in compass, international emergency calling, assortment of colors. And again, the low price point uh, starts at $399 for this and their Series 3 watch is now only $199, and it's $499 if you want the cellular built into the device. They're also focusing on the recycled materials, which I'll get into a little more that they use for the watch and for the iPads. Now for the big thing everybody was interested in, right? The new iPhones out there. So they launched the iPhone 11. I was really hoping that the rumor mill was wrong on this one, that we would see some real innovation here. What we see here instead, is iterative upgrades, uh, a lot of upgrade to the camera, but iterative upgrades everywhere else. So you get six new colors, yay, they can paint. Um, they've got anodized aluminum and glass still. So uh, the whole glass thing just blows my mind. It's just another way of, you know, guaranteeing people to buy cases or 
that they're going to drop it and be paying the ridiculous repair fees and insurance for these things. But there you go. Anodized aluminum frame and glass all around. 6.1 inch liquid retina screen. Um, same black ugly bar across. They didn't do anything there, at least in the Android uh, Samsung Spectrum. They now just have the dot. This still has the whole bar going across. There you go, complete with the arch. And you see that big black bar? Well, that's still on there for the big black bar on the top of the screens here. Obviously, they're showing the back of the phones in their advertisement uh, and not the front of the phone. Um, so you got the same ugly black bar. They do have some new audio using uh, virtualization um, software that uses Dolby Atmos and supposedly virtualizes sound to make it sound like it's coming from all around. So they've improved the sound. You've got a lot of work going into the cameras. I could spend a whole show talking about all the specs of the cameras, but you got dual cameras, wide cameras, new sensors, ultra wide cameras all built into this thing. If you are into, I guess, professional photography on your phone, is that a thing? Then you will love this. Um, personally, I just want to get a good picture from my phone. I'm not expecting you know, professional photo grade or professional videos, but it is the device that even though I have all these mirrorless cameras and things that I carry around with me at all times, and it is the device I take most of the pictures of my family with. So it, it, it's good that they're upgrading the camera, but this pretty much is the big upgrade is the camera. You get next gen HDR, they're calling it stereoscopic depth, um, new high key mono, night mode, 4K video, 60 frames per second, stabilization. I'm pretty sure last gen samsung devices had the 4k 60 frames per second htc all of those but they've got that now 12 megapixel front camera uh the front camera 4k 60 frames per second they said well they said 30 frame and then they came back and mentioned could do 60 so i don't know what that's all about but it's interesting that they're really focusing on the selfie people out there that like to take selfies and videos of themselves um, they have the new A13 bionic it's the fastest chip out there they're saying the a12 is still the fastest cpu and GPU out on the market, and the A13 is even faster than that, although I didn't see any percentages to show how much faster it was. Um, you know, they have little bar graphs across, but no percentages there. But anyways, it's faster than the A12, which they're saying is still faster than the Galaxy or Huawei phone out there uh, on the market. Um, showed uh, Pascal's Wager video game from Giant Network, which was really cool. It was an ARPG dark fantasy, kind of like The Witcher, um, and so they were showing that that game could play on 60 frames per second, really intense, you know, good 3D graphics and great shading and that stuff, but you're still playing on your phone. And I, I just cannot get, I love gaming, but I just cannot get playing on a phone. I have the XS Max here. I have the Samsung Galaxy 8 Plus and gaming on my phone is just not enjoyable for me. But there are people out there who do it. I know there's a lot of kids who play Fortnite and things like that on their phone. So there you go. Uh, battery life is now an hour more than the XR. Well, I get eight to 10 hours on the XS today. So I guess you might be getting nine to 11 hours or something out of it. Uh, two mil two meter water resistance for 30 minutes. And this was the shocking point for me was the $699 price tag. I was expecting the thousand dollar price tag that they've been running out there with, but they came in at $699 for this, which isn't reasonable a phone but it's still far better than the thousand dollar price tag everyone's trying to get us used to so i think you see the phone market backing away from that thousand dollar price tag and perhaps that's because their last gen phones which all carried close to the thousand dollar price tag has they, they've seen a loss of people instead of a gain um, so the other thing they released is another phone the iphone 11 pro so this is surgical grade stainless steel and a glass coating. Still have that stupid glass coating. Matte texture finish, gray, green, silver, gold, two sizes, 5.8, 6.8 inches, super retina display, OLED, two million to one contrast ratio, P3 wide color, 15% more energy efficient in the same stupid black bar across the top of the screen. Um, so they're calling this their Super Retina XDR display. Four more hours of battery life than the iPhone XS. Five more hours than the iPhone XS Max. That's where the Pro part comes in. Your phone lasts the whole day. Uh, fast charge adapter comes in the box. They talk about, again, the camera system. It's got the Pro camera system. They showed professional photographers taking photos with it. Uh, it comes with the ultra-wide camera, 120-degree field of view, image signal processors, uh, four times optical 
uh, you know, they, the professional photos looked amazing. They had tons of depth to them. They showed the 4k video where they took a professional Hollywood director and had them use the phone to make a kind of movie short. And it was fantastic. I mean, it was absolutely beautiful. Um, they also did a sneak peek of a new technology called deep fusion, which is for low to medium light pictures. It takes nine images at once, fuses them together um, and creates a beautiful output for low light situations, but that doesn't come out, uh, yet that's coming, I guess this fall. So video 4k 60 frame per second on all cameras there. Um, so this phone though, again, hits that thousand dollar price mark. I guess they're renaming the thousand dollar price mark, the pro line, $999 for the uh, smaller version and 1099 for the max version of this one. Again, a heavy focus on the A13 Bionic chip that's going into there, talking about the CPU, GPU, neural engines working together, their machine learning, um, accelerators, matrix multipliers, trillion operations per second. It was interesting that they talked about the seven nanometer architecture going into the phone. Somebody else that I actually am a fanboy for, AMD, uh, doing a lot in the seven nanometer range, allowing them to have 8.5 billion transistors, four efficiency CPU cores, Voltage domains, which was interesting. So they're only turning on parts of the phone as you need it versus having everything available to the CPUs at once. So I thought that was really interesting of them. So the iPhone 11 Pro, it was, uh, again, an iterative upgrade. It's a good phone, but there are some things that are heavily missing. So I want to talk about what I wish we would have seen from Apple here. And then I'm going to talk about some of the good things. Obviously, this was heavily focused on services and focused on their cameras for their devices here. 5G, of course, has already launched. There are phones out there with 5G now. All the major carriers are pushing 5G and building it out into the big city area specifically. Uh, this phone doesn't have 5G. So that to me was a huge miss on Apple's part to not have 5G. The big giant black bar across the screen is just stupid at this point and silly and no innovation to fix that was an absolute shame in my opinion. Um, also, I'm sick of the phone covers. You know, every time I buy a phone, I've got to go buy a cover on top of it, which could be anywhere from, depending on how much I like the phone, a $10 expenditure to a $50 expenditure, how much I paid for the phone. And, I, you know, you've got these beautiful phones. Every time I take my iPhone out of the case, I'm like, wow, it's gorgeous. It feels so small and light and I could stick it in my pocket. But the glass back on it alone is an outrageous insurance, you know, expenditure if you break it or drop it. And we all drop our phones. So this idea that you make these gorgeous phones and then the first thing we do is cover them up with a case is stupid. If you wanted to do something truly innovative, come out with a phone that doesn't need a stupid case to go onto it and can take the drops and bounces and abuse that we put our phones through. That would have been an innovative upgrade, but no, we get this really strong glass on the back that heaven forbid you break. Um, innovative accessories would have been nice. Look at the Zeus ROG phone where they're coming with all of these mobile attachments to turn it into a Nintendo Switch like experience for gaming. So you want to focus on the gaming services, but you don't have any real attachments coming from Apple or accessories to turn it into an actual gaming platform. That would have been nice. 120 hertz screens. Uh, would have been nice. 144 hertz, things that we're seeing in the Android market. Repairability and modularity. You know, everyone talks about Apple being the green company out there, but uh, as I've talked about in prior videos or episode at least of Destination Linux podcast that I'm on about getting a MacBook Pro that was perfectly capable of, late, of running the latest Mac OS operating system. But of course, when you go to download it officially from Apple, it tells you, oh, I'm sorry, your device is obsolete. Uh, you know, they, they basically purposely make devices obsolete at a certain point and there's no way to upgrade it. And it's just a complete waste of um, resources, of rare earth metals and resources that we're putting into these phones. Now, they did talk about a recycling program that they have where now you can turn in your phone to the Apple store and trade up to different devices and the recycling little devices, but not everything in those phones can be recycled. So there's just a huge amount of waste 
So if you wanted to really impress me, bring out a phone with modularity where the iterative upgrades, when I need the new camera, I can just buy the camera from Apple and slap it in. Uh, Motorola, I believe, has tried this in the past, but someone like Apple probably could really pull it off in a good way. So those would have been the things that would have impressed me. Those are the things that I'd like to see in the next generations of phones, repairability, the ability to repair these things yourself. We've got to get out of this throwaway culture that we have, especially when you're asking people to throw thousands of dollars into a phone. It's just ridiculous. Now, one of the things that I did like that they actually didn't cover in the conference at all is some of the privacy enhancements coming in the latest iOS. Facebook apparently has had to recently make a official announcement regarding this because now people are going to see just how creepy Facebook is. But in iOS 13, you know, when you download an app and it says, hey, we're going to utilize these permissions or this app wants um, permission to, you know, access your cameras, access your file system, access your contacts. And one of the features that I like about iPhone is that you could turn off, you could say no to those features and the app still has to work. Now, if the, if the app you download is a camera app and you tell it, no, you can't access the camera, then the app will still open. You're just not going to have anything there. But if the app is, say, um, I don't know, a social messaging app and it wants access to the camera and you tell it no, it will still have to run. Whereas on Android, a lot of times they design the app. So if you say no to any of the permissions, that whole app will not work. Well, they've taken it a step further here because now when those apps are doing creepy things like attaching your location, trying to take your location and send it back to uh, the mother base there, it will actually put a little pop-up on your screen saying, hey, by the way, Facebook is grabbing your location right now. So you can see just how creepy and invasive these apps are. And hopefully it will encourage a lot of people to start deleting these services that are complete garbage. And Facebook won't be the only one, although the fact that they reacted in the market to say, hey, by the way, we do this. We, we grab your information and, and uh, your location when you have the app open and even sometimes when you don't. So uh, sorry, uh, they had to release that announcement out there probably for fear of lawsuits and things, uh, I would guess. Then this shows that this is going to be an effective way of kind of hopefully toning down uh, the privacy invasion of some of these apps and things out there. And rumor is Android may be doing something similar, but I haven't really in Android 10, but we'll have to see. Again, one of the big problems with Android is the disparity when it comes to actual upgrades, which supposedly they're gonna work on where you can get upgrades from the Google store itself. But for instance, the latest iOS adoption rates are like in the 80 plus percent, 88% of the devices have the latest OS. That's where your security patches come in. That's where all the important things from security happen in the latest iterations and upgrades there. But in Android, you have a much different situation. I've looked at multiple sites. They all have different numbers. But what you can see is like the latest, I think, is the Pi is at a 10.4% adoption rate on some. On other sites, it shows uh, maybe a 20% adoption rate. But either way, uh, what we know for sure is that the, the Android devices because it's controlled by the manufacturers who generally don't support them after one or two OS updates and or the telecom companies themselves, that Android tends to always be the users are stuck with outdated, unpatched operating systems in mass compared to what you deal with with Apple, which is one of the security advantages Apple has. Hopefully, Google actually fixes that, as they say with the Play Store, allowing you to download the security and patch updates at least without having to go through the manufacturer uh, or telecom company. So that's pretty much it from the Apple event. I would say pretty uneventful overall, an iterative upgrade. It's cool they're using seven nanometer technology. Their CPU and GPU is very, very powerful. It's always been the one to really compete against out there and their iterative upgrades to it continue to get better. If you're a professional uh, photographer, uh, then you may like having this iPhone as kind of a backup. Obviously, it wouldn't replace a true SLR, uh, despite their claims of it being a pro camera and some of the great advancements they've made in the camera arena for here. But certainly as a backup camera, I've heard pro photographers say that they'll, they'll use their phone in a pinch if something happened with their DSLR, uh, something horrible, then they could take good photos there. Um, so they've done a lot when it comes to the photography side, and that's where the focus is here. I, I don't know if I personally would spend the money to upgrade. 
I certainly wouldn't spend the money for the iPhone 11 Pro, being that it's not 5G, but if you're on the Apple uh, ecosystem and you want to, you have to upgrade now, maybe your phone's broke or something, then the 699 uh, iPhone is probably your best bet. Um, 11, iPhone 11 here. And you can also go to the stores now and pay per month because a lot of people don't have $699. So they have now in the Apple store, you can, and I thought they always had this, but they act like it was new in there. Uh, or you can $399 for the phone with a trade-in uh, as an option as well. So you can trade in your devices. So not the things that I wanted to hear, although I'm happy they're continuing to focus on the privacy front. front. Some people have given them a lot of heat for their claims on being private and secure. And while I like the fact that we're giving them heat and putting pressure on them, I'm seeing Apple react in a positive way, like the notification systems, and I hope it continues to get better. I think they're far more private than Google's uh, ecosystem out there. Um, but there are other alternatives such as Lineage OS out there and other operating systems like Sailfish and E and things that obviously I think are even more secure than Apple or Android because they take uh, that ecosystem and they make it open source so people can actually look at what the phone is doing. Uh, but there are some trade-offs and sometimes people have to have certain uh, ecosystems based on work or whatnot. So in those cases, I think if you had to use a Google or Android, or sorry, Google Android or an Apple, uh, from a security and privacy standpoint, I believe they're both knee have a lot of room for improvement, but iPhone is superior in that front. Leave your hate mail below. I don't care. I've been in the industry for 20 years. Fight me real life. In any case, that's my review of this event. Let me know in the comments what you think. When it comes to Linux, it's interesting here because you're seeing Apple go fully for this kind of mobile uh, space, right? They, they're moving away from the MacBooks and the desktops uh, at least slightly, and they're really trying to push this agenda of replacing your desktop with the iPad there. So it will be interesting if they'll be successful there. Uh, obviously, you have Microsoft focusing on the Surface and Surface Book, more of a two-in-one type situation versus a complete replacement. The either way, everything's getting smaller and lighter and handheld, and that's where the industry seems to be facing. Um, you know, Linux really doesn't have a great com com a competitor when it comes to the tablet space. There's no hardware out there that's made specifically for Linux to run on. There are people who have adapted Surface Books and other things to run Linux, but we don't have a true Linux solution out there in this mobile tablet space um, just yet. Although there's a lot of things coming, I would definitely check out Pine64 with their Pine tablet. You've got the Pine phone coming out. You have their low cost uh, Pine laptop pro out there. Uh, which you can order now, which would be a competition for like a Chromebook. So there's some moves in this arena, but I think Linux really is going to, from a desktop consumer market, really have to catch up in this front. Obviously, they're dominating the server market. But when it comes to desktops, you're seeing a lot of the industries move to this kind of mobile uh, platform there. So it'll be interesting to see how this all evolves. Let me know your thoughts. And until next time, get out there and fill your brains. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to watch the video.